Greetings and salutations, everyone. My name is Andrew Kirikoff, and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today, we're talking about six must-draft running backs for the 2023 fantasy football season. Now, the last time I spoke about must-draft running backs, it was in regards to running backs that were associated with elite levels of offensive line play, specifically offensive lines going into the 2023 season that were the best in terms of run-blocking grades. Offensive lines like the Philadelphia Eagles, Detroit Lions, Minnesota Vikings, and of course the running backs associated with them. But on today's episode, I just want to talk about stud running backs. Players that are being often overlooked despite being running backs that are being selected in the second or even third rounds. They're often being overlooked in comparison to the players that are drafted ahead of them. Therefore, I want to talk about these six players, give you guys statistical data that I've collected this offseason that justifies the reasons as to why you should be approaching your draft, keeping an eye on these running backs that you could potentially have on roster. Again, I want to talk about running backs like a Tony Pollard, a stud running back that despite the fact that he's coming off of underdog fantasy draft boards at 16.5 or RB6, I mean, again, I tried to approach this conversation a couple days ago in regards to that rankings changes video where I talked about Brees Hall, Dalvin Cook, Ramondre Stevenson, Ezekiel Elliott, the free agent signing. I tried to mention the idea that considering Dalvin Cook and Ezekiel Elliott signed elsewhere and are not going to be members of the Dallas Cowboys this upcoming season, there is even more opportunity for Tony Pollard to meet his actualized upside of being potentially a top three fantasy running back this upcoming season and being a league winner. You have to take into account his career from 2019 through 2022. He has only had 510 rushing attempts. Last season alone, Derrick Henry had 349. Just putting into perspective the wear and tear on his body, it is very limited in comparison to other running backs in this top tier conversation, and he's going to have this entire backfield to himself. Now, when Tony Pollard has been given the opportunity of playing 50% or more of the offensive snaps in his career, again, the last four seasons, he's only done that 10 times. But when he's given that opportunity, averaging 18.16 half PPR fantasy points per game, opportunity leads to success and that's what we're going to continue to see with tony pollard going into the season in the 16 games throughout his career where he's been given 15 or more opportunities opportunities are rushing attempts and targets combined he's averaging 18.25 half ppr fantasy points per game throughout his career averaging a 5.13 yard per carry average which is all time top 10 amongst all running backs with at least 400 rushing attempts minimum Tony Pollard is a special running back. We have witnessed that last season. Amongst all running backs in 2022, who had a minimum of 100 rushing attempts, he was number one amongst all of them in terms of yards per carry after contact, averaging 3.82. On top of it, was number three amongst all running backs with 100 or more rushing attempts with a 5.22 yard per carry average. Just spouting off those statistics give me flashbacks of, of numbers that I talk about in regards to Nick Chubb. Someone that is one of the best running backs in terms of rushing attempts per season. And when we look at Tony Pollard and how successful he was on the ground, having 16.1% of his rushing attempts last season, consisting of 10 or more rushing yards, those are Nick Chubb levels of production on the ground and hopefully are going to continue this upcoming season as we get more opportunity going his direction. Because again, Ezekiel Elliott cut this offseason. There is no one else competing for rushing attempts within this offense. In the three games in which Tony Pollard in his career has played without Zeke in the lineup, he's averaging 27.23 fantasy points per game. In those three games, averaging 136 total yards and two touchdowns per game. Unbelievable numbers. And again, like I mentioned, there is a boatload of opportunity available as Zeke with his 231 rushing attempts, 12 rushing touchdowns last season is gone, vacated. Again, Zeke was successful last year within this offense because of how well the Dallas Cowboys have built this offense and how their scheme has fit in. Last season, Zeke had a nine game streak of at least one rushing touchdown minimum throughout week six through 17. And throughout that span of time, despite the fact that Zeke was scoring touchdowns and averaging over 15.6 fantasy points per game, Tony Pollard throughout that same span of time was also averaging 15.6 half PPR fantasy points per game. There is a lot of upside within this backfield. And now that Zeke is gone, the rushing attempts down on the goal line, the most important rushing attempt opportunities in all of fantasy football, those inside the five yard line, they're now vacated. Zeke had 16 of those attempts last season that led to nine rushing touchdowns, while Pollard only had six of those attempts that led to two rushing touchdowns. Imagine if they all go into Pollard's direction, or at least 80% of them do. Double-digit rushing touchdowns is absolutely in the realm of possibility for Tony Pollard this upcoming season. And for those of you who are considering the idea that another running back in this backfield is going to take away opportunities, sure, they're going to go ahead and spread it out, but who out of Malik Davis, you know, Deuce Vaughn, uh, Ronald Jones, who's been suspended, I don't even know, he may have been cut by now. I mean, th there are running backs in this backfield that aren't going to be guys that come in and immediately are making an impact and vying for opportunities in comparison to one of the most, if not the most efficient running back over the course of the last couple seasons here. And on top of it, 
he's going to be on the field on third down. So I don't expect Deuce Vaughn to be out there taking away his opportunities because when you look at his receiving capabilities, additionally, when you look at his pass blocking capabilities, amongst all running backs last season, Tony Pollard had the second highest pass blocking grade and quite frankly was better than Ezekiel Elliott in that category last season, which kept Pollard on the field. The coaching staff change, again, going from Kellen Moore to Brian Schottenheimer is going to make a difference. But Brian Schottenheimer, the last time he was an offensive coordinator in the NFL, 2018 through 2020 with the Seattle Seahawks, the team was number four in terms of running back rushing attempts throughout that span of time. We have heard Mike McCarthy say he wants to run the damn ball this season so that he can get his defense some rest. They're going to do that this year with Tony Pollard. And the sky's the limit in terms of his fantasy potential. So please, you must draft Tony Pollard this season. Okay, now before we get into any other running backs, couple reminders if you guys have not yet already and you enjoy content like this be sure to subscribe to the channel we're making daily fantasy football content for the entirety of the season whether it is must draft videos draft strategies tier lists sleepers all of that this off season going into the regular season as we have daily content with rankings you know trade targets waiver wire videos live streams before kickoff on sunday all of that in order to help you win a 2023 fantasy football championship. Now, for those of you who want an additional advantage over the course of the season, be sure to travel down to the description of the video. Head on over to Underdog Fantasy. At this current moment in time, if you sign up using code Andrew and make a first-time deposit minimum of $10, not only are you going to get a first-time deposit match, you're additionally going to get my 2023 fantasy football draft guide and rankings. The draft guide is hundreds of hours of you know, content that I've collected this off season that represents my methodology as to how I approach every single position and how I draft them accordingly and statistics that justify the reasons as to why my approach is as such and why I found success doing so. Additionally, the rankings that are within this draft guide are by position, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, kicker, and defense by tier. Half PPR, full PPR, four point per passing touchdown, six point per passing touchdown. On top of it, top 200 flex, which includes all four primary positions of fantasy football. Those rankings will be updated every single week. For those of you who have already signed up, be sure to check your spam email because I sent an update earlier this morning, uh, August 19th at about 4 a.m. So be sure to keep an eye out for that. It may have ended up in your spam. Otherwise, an Excel sheet has arrived in your email. Check that out if you're drafting this weekend and best of luck. So again, besides the draft guide, Besides the rankings that will be updated over the course of August, so regardless of when you're drafting, you are ready to find success on draft day, we're additionally going to be sending you guys up-to-date rankings every single Sunday morning from weeks 1 through 18 with those week's rankings by position, by tier, half PPR, full PPR, because again, the entire purpose of the channel is to help you win a fantasy football championship, and this is another way to do so. So take advantage of the opportunity on hand. Again, for those of you who are wondering if you are eligible, the states that are highlighted on the right determine eligibility. You can go ahead, sign up today, get some experience drafting via Underdog Fantasy and their multitude of best ball drafts. Draft responsibly. Thank you very much. All right. Let's go ahead and talk about the next running back that, in my opinion, is a must-draft candidate. Considering his current ADP is 99.0, an RB32 off the board. And I understand there may be a little bit of hype gathering around Khalil Herbert after he took that screen pass in the first you know, preseason game of the Chicago Bears to the house. But that's not the reasoning as to why I have such a high affinity to his potential this upcoming season. The offense he's associated with, the offensive line, the entire scheme is built for Khalil Herbert to find himself success. And he was able to prove that over the course of last season and in seasons prior. Specifically last year, Khalil Herbert in terms of efficiency, was one of the best running backs. In fact, amongst all running backs with 100 attempts minimum, he was number one in terms of yards per carry average, averaging 5.67 yards per carry as a member of the Chicago Bears offense. Now, just to put that into perspective, that was a higher yard per carry average than Tony Pollard. And we talked about you know how efficient he has been for 10 minutes there, if I'm not mistaken. But again, very efficient numbers from Khalil Herbert. Additionally, in terms of yards per carry after contact, being able to make contact, and continue to roll forward. Khalil Herbert averaged 3.67 yards, which was number three amongst all running backs with 100 attempts minimum, only behind guys like Tony Pollard and Ramondre Stevenson. Again, a lot of efficiency from those running backs. But again, like we've talked about, opportunity leads to success in fantasy football. You have a higher potential of scoring more fantasy points when you are given more rushing attempts and more targets. In the last two seasons, in games in which Khalil Herbert has played 50 or more percent of the offensive snaps, he averaged 14.97 fantasy points per game on top of it in those games averaging 21.7 opportunities per game and 21.5 touches per game incredible statistics while also averaging 4.94 
rushing yards per attempt, and of course, 6.7 yards per reception. His yards per reception number isn't incredible, but as long as you're efficient on the ground and you're getting yourself sprinkles of receiving work, associated with a offense that has a rushing quarterback typically does not give you the higher upside of getting more receiving work, but nonetheless, if he's able to you know gather a couple receptions here or there, we're not going to complain about it. In the last two seasons, in games in which Khalil Herbert has had himself 13 or more touches, averaging 15.11 fantasy points per game. Now, like I just mentioned moments ago, being associated with Justin Fields is going to be difficult. But that being said, last season when this offense took a step forward from weeks 5 through 17, when Justin Fields took over the fantasy landscape and the National Football League, throughout that span of time, the Chicago Bears backfields were averaging 20.7 rushing attempts per game, 86 rushing yards per game, 0.55 rushing touchdowns, 3.36 targets, 2.64 receptions, 24 receiving yards, and 16.34 fantasy points per game as a backfield. Overall, it definitely did have to do with the impact of Justin Fields having himself 11.5 rushing attempts per game, 90.6 rushing yards per game, and 0.64 rushing touchdowns per game. Obviously, that made a huge difference. But ultimately, we still have determined that there is value to be had within this backfield, especially considering you know, David Montgomery in seasons past has proven that. David Montgomery, in terms of opportunity last year, despite being highly inefficient with his opportunities, in 12 of his 16 games that he played, 15 or more touches. Last season finished as RB23, and seasons prior has finished as the RB21, RB4, and RB25 within this offense. So we know that there is a capability of a Chicago Bears starting running back to be a top 24 prospect. Yet again, the current ADP sits Khalil Herbert at RB32. And I understand that there may be some questions revolving around Deontay Foreman being signed as a free agent this offseason, the rookie out of Texas that this team drafted at the running back position. But with the first team offense, Khalil Herbert was on the field throughout the entirety of the preseason game. And as soon as the second team came in with the backup quarterback, Deontay Foreman led the pack. This is his job to lose, and I don't think he's going to lose it considering how effective he is as a running back considering he has the fourth easiest strength of schedule amongst all running backs this upcoming season and has the fifth highest graded offensive line, according to Pro Football Focus, going into the 2023 year, there is a lot of upside to be had with such an efficient running back in an offense that has proven to have running back value, but at his current ADP, coming off the board as pick 99, he's one of those running backs that if you avoid early running backs, prioritizing wide receiver, quarterback, and tight end, you might want to go back in selecting Khalil Herbert as a must-draft candidate. Moving on, let's talk about Josh Jacobs. Josh Jacobs is a running back that currently is RB9 off the board or an ADP of 31. At this current moment in time, there may be some questions and there may be some anticipation for him potentially not to play. I understand the fear that revolves around that, but going into this upcoming season, I expect Josh Jacobs and the Las Vegas Raiders to find themselves a deal in the coming weeks for him to sign, to practice, and be ready for week one. And worst case scenario, if you're someone who invests in Josh Jacobs like myself, Go ahead and spend a later round pick, specifically a pick that has an ADP of 169.4 via underdog fantasy or RB54, Zamir White. Pick up Zamir White because you know that he'll be the guy that takes all the rushing opportunities henceforth if there is going to be an absence in any sort of span of time in regards to Josh Jacobs. So again, another you know pretty decent investment similar to the Le'Veon Bell, James Conner in seasons past, Ezekiel Elliott, Tony Pollard. You want to have insurance on these stud running backs, do it with Zamir White. It's not a problem and it's not costing you much because the anticipation by many of us is that Josh Jacobs will return to the starting lineup and of course be a fantastic fantasy running back. Now this time last season, the whole conversation regarding Josh Jacobs was, hey, is he even going to be the starter for this team? He started in that Hall of Fame game they brought in Zamir White. The organization did not take advantage of his fifth year on his rookie contract. So everything was kind of in a negative spin. But we talked about it last year this time. Every single season throughout Josh Jacobs' career, he has been an RB1. Last season, of course, putting up his best statistical season with 17.75 fantasy points per game. The number three overall running back healthy throughout the whole year in 2021. After the injury, the turf toe he was dealing with from weeks 4 through 18 was the number 7 overall running back, averaging over 13 fantasy points per game in 2020. Healthy the whole season was RB8. Go back to 2019, his rookie year. Prior to the injury was RB11, averaging 14 fantasy points per game. 
Josh Jacobs has been a consistent option in this offense, regardless of who the head coach slash offensive coordinator is, and regardless of how the offensive line is structured in front of him, he is still a successful running back. And I understand that there is going to be regression going into 2023, considering the numbers that he put up last season, setting career highs in rushing attempts, rushing yards, rushing touchdowns, receiving yards and fantasy points. I understand that all. Truly, I do. And it is impossible for a running back who had 393 touches to duplicate a season as such, because like I've mentioned before, LaDainian Tomlinson and Ricky Williams back in 2002, 2003 are the only other running backs that have been able to accomplish that. I know someone in the comment section last time I mentioned that statistic said Le'Veon Bell question mark. And I was like, yo, Le'Veon Bell is not even in that conversation. The only time he has had more than 393 touches in a season, the following year he sat out. So just putting that into perspective. But when you give Josh Jacobs opportunity, which he'll get a boatload of, especially this year with Jimmy G under center, in 15 of the 17 games last season, 15 or more touches, averaging 19.17 fantasy points per game. On top of it, if you look at his entire career with the Las Vegas Raiders, 47 of his 60 starts, 15 plus touches, 16.94 fantasy points per game. That's 78.33% of the time in which he's getting 15 or more touches within this offense. He's a running back that last season averaged 4.87 yards per carry. Pretty good number. Number six amongst all running backs with a minimum of 175 rushing attempts. On top of it, averaged 3.41 yards after contact per attempt number seven amongst all running backs with 175 attempts minimum across the league again demonstrated that he is a fantastic running back on the ground fantastic but additionally when you give him opportunity through the air a stud now a couple of the things that we want to keep into account last season of the 64 targets that josh jacobs had only one of those 64 targets were on third down 59 of them were on first and second down and the remaining four targets were on fourth down he is not a third down back he's going to be on the field you know potentially pass blocking but he did not get any sort of utilization in the passing game on third downs now when we look at jimmy g and what he presents to this offense remember with christian mccaffrey last season from weeks 8 through 12 christian mccaffrey ran 95 routes was targeted 28 times that's a 29.47 percent target rate Additionally, those 28 targets led to 23 receptions, 178 yards, a receiving touchdown. So we know that Jimmy G is capable of dicing it up and getting his running backs the ball in the passing game. On top of it, we have seen Josh McDaniels, the offensive play caller, the brains behind the entire operation of this organization. He has utilized his running backs at a very high rate over the course of his career, whether it has been with the Raiders or with the New England Patriots as their former offensive coordinator. There is a lot of opportunity here. Do not let the fear of Josh Jacobs potentially not being available for week one, scare you away from drafting him. It reminds me of a lot of last season's fear of, oh, is Josh Jacobs even the starter? And people got a discount on one of the best backs in the league. Okay, moving on. Let's talk about Rashad White, the running back out of Tampa Bay, who currently has an ADP of 85.1, RB number 29. I understand that this offense is going to look wholly different without Tom Brady in the lineup. I mean, in the last three years, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, number one in terms of total passing attempts as an offense, number one in completions, number two in passing yards, and number three in passing touchdowns. The only time they were behind teams in those categories were the Kansas City Chiefs. So they were definitely in the top two conversation in terms of being a passing offense over the last three seasons, which led to a lot of opportunities at the running back position as they had the third most targets amongst all running backs, second most RB receptions, eighth most RB receiving yards, and fifth most RB receiving touchdowns. So now that we transition to the Baker Mayfield era of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, are we going to see a huge downshift in terms of overall opportunities? Absolutely. Tom Brady is a guy that is far less mobile and is trying to get the ball out of his hands. And this is going to be with a different offensive coordinator going into 2023, which may shift some things. But what is going to stay consistent is Rashad White's overall opportunity. Last season from weeks one through nine, was averaging 6.44 touches per game and 4.36 fantasy points per game throughout the first nine games of his NFL career. Now, after that, Leonard Fournette began to slow down, got some injuries, and from weeks 10 through 17, Rashad White was averaging 16.71 touches per game and 10.5 half PPR fantasy points per game for the final seven games of his season. There is going to be a lot of opportunity considering the release of Leonard Fournette from this offense and the fact that they have no backfield competition with only Keyshawn Vaughn and Chase Edmonds as the other running backs that are going to be contributing to this backfield. As an offense that is going to be in a lot of negative game scripts, they're going to have to throw the ball for majority of games. And Rashad White is not only a capable receiving back, but highly accomplished. Last season amongst all running backs in the National Football League was in the top 12 in terms of targets a top 11 in terms of receptions, top 19 in terms of receiving yards, top 12 in terms of receiving touchdowns, and top 20 in terms of running back routes ran. Overall, great numbers that we're going to continue to see this upcoming season because of the way that these game scripts are going to kind of play out. 
And I understand his lack of effectiveness last season may have you a little bit scared of investing in a running back as such, but a running back that is currently sitting at RB29, who in my mind is easily a top 23 running back this upcoming season. Just to give you some perspective as to why I believe he's a top 24 capable running back, since 2019, there have been 47 running backs who have had 150 rushing attempts and 40 receptions within a given season. After totaling those numbers, of those 47 running backs, 45 of them put up a base minimum of 159.8 half PPR fantasy points per game. Last season, 159.8 fantasy points was Devin Singletary's total production as RB24. In seasons past, it's been RB24 again, RB21, and RB23. Without a doubt in my mind, if you're capable of accomplishing 40 receptions and 150 rushing yards like we have seen in the past, what, four years, there is an extremely high likelihood that if you're staying healthy, you're getting the utilization, you're going to be a top 24 back. And that's why I'm leaning in that direction with Rashad White making him a must-draft option going into this upcoming season. And I understand, like I mentioned before, the lack of, lack of effectiveness is certainly there, even when we include the playoff game. Only averaged 3.83 yards per attempt last season and 6.03 yards per reception. Obviously not incredible numbers, but with opportunity comes success in fantasy football, regardless of inefficiencies. We have seen year over year running backs being given a boatload of opportunities, and despite the fact that they have been inefficient, those opportunities will outscore other backs because they're just getting more chances of scoring fantasy points, and it continues to trickle up. Last season, in games in which Rashad White played 50% or more of the offensive snaps, averaged 10.22 fantasy points per game. 15 plus touches in five games, averaged 11.06 fantasy points per game. I think there's a very high upside for Rashad White, and based on his current value, he really is a must-draft candidate going into the 2023 season. Along with guys like maybe even James Cook, they are very similar in their approach going into this year. James Cook's not on today's video, but the next running back I wanted to talk about is Joe Mixon. Joe Mixon currently sitting as RB15 and an ADP of 42.4. Okay, let's just put this out there. There are some legal troubles that are currently revolving around Joe Mixon. Recently, he was deemed not guilty for a current case, and I understand there's another one that is currently looming or in the vicinity. I do not believe that is going to impact a potential suspension for Joe Mixon. So let's just put everything on the table. When Joe Mixon has been healthy in his career, He's been RB13 or better in fantasy football. Again, yes, still, he's RB15 going into this year. I understand he's getting up there in age, but this is still a running back that last season, prior to his injury, was on pace for RB6 last season based on averages. Opportunity leads to success in fantasy football, right? Amongst all running backs in the National Football League, in the last two seasons, Joe Mixon has seen elite levels of opportunity, unlike many others. From 2021 to 2022, averaging 20.13 touches per game. In the last 30 games he has played, averaging 15.88 fantasy points per game throughout that span of time. Additionally, when Joe Mixon has been given 18 or more touches in a game, averaging 19 fantasy points per game, 19 of those 30 overall games that he's participated in. The Cincinnati Bengals last season, despite having the 24th most rushing attempts for their running backs, 9th most targets, and 22nd most opportunities overall, Brian Callahan, the offensive coordinator of this team, has established that they want a three down back. And they proved that last season when Joe Mixon was healthy. Joe Mixon not only got all the rushing work, but additionally got himself an average of 5.36 targets per game and 4.29 receptions per game, which were both career highs and on a pace for 91 targets and 73 receptions last season. And despite the fact that he was inefficient last season with a 3.88 yard per carry average, 33rd amongst all running backs with 100 attempts and also had a measly 2.63 Yards after contact per attempt average, number 36 amongst all running backs with 100 attempts or minimum. Again, there, there were only like 40 running backs in that conversation. So definitely at the bottom of that list. But despite that inefficiency, like I've mentioned with Rashad White, as long as you're given opportunity, it does not matter how inefficient you are, you are continuing to score fantasy points. And when you're put into situations to get opportunities such as a high volume of targets and goal line work, now that Samaj P. Ryan is additionally gone, that is more targets available and more goal line work available for Joe Mixon. You got to remember, in the four games that Joe Mixon missed last season or left early due to an injury, Samaj P. Ryan stepped in and was averaging 20.08 fantasy points per game. Unbelievable numbers because we know that this offense, whoever their lead back is, is going to be capable of high levels of opportunity and production based on the scheme and the talent that surrounds them. Whether it's offensive line receivers that you know kind of pull off pressure and one of the best quarterbacks in the game. It was only a couple seasons ago, 2021, when Joe Mixon was, you know, top tier running back in fantasy football. He was a guy that was handling 71% 
of the RB opportunities out of the Cincinnati Bengals backfield within that given season. And again, like I mentioned, there's no more Samaj P. Ryan. He's gone. So what can we potentially expect to see this upcoming season? Well, probably majority of the opportunities going in his direction in a sense of 70 or more percent of those opportunities. Specifically, when I went ahead and looked at Joe Mixon in his 2022 campaign, in terms of games in which he was playing and active, and he didn't leave due to injury or didn't miss due to injury, he was setting career highs in terms of percentages of attempts, rushing yards, targets, receptions, receiving yards, receiving touchdowns, fantasy points out of this backfield. He was handling 81% of the rushing uh, attempts, 79.72, pretty much 80% of the rushing yards. He was handling 66% of the targets, 68% of the receiving yardage. I mean, the backfield was his. And if you continue to stack on numbers to him, more targets, more attempts, more opportunities to score fantasy points, especially down in the red zone. This is an offense that last season amongst all teams in terms of full team opportunity in the red zone when we're talking about opportunities on the five yard line and in. The Cincinnati Bengals had 22 rushing attempts inside the five yard line, which was the 10th most amongst all teams in the National Football League. That led to nine rushing touchdowns, which was also 10th most amongst all teams in the National Football League. Overall, in terms of opportunity in the red zone, especially down on the goal line, they're going to have opportunity for the running back, and it's going to be Joe Mixon. A couple of the stats that I've pulled in regards to Joe Mixon, his potential this upcoming year. In the last decade of football, any running back who has had 200 or more rushing attempts and 60 receptions in a year, there have been 22 instances of that in the last decade from running backs. 18 of those 22 running backs finished top five in their season. And the other running backs finishes RB9, RB11, RB12, and RB17. The only running back that was outside of the top 12 was, of course, Le'Veon Bell with the New York Jets. The only RB that was RB12 was, was Joe Mixon last season. And the only RB that was RB11 was Ramondre Stevenson last season. Otherwise, we have seen high levels of production. Yet, Joe Mixon's RB15 must draft Joe Mixon this upcoming season. The last running back I wanted to mention is someone that is probably unpopular. And before you even think about it, I understand. Yes, Aaron Jones is the starting running back of the Green Bay Packers offense. That is a given. But you got to take advantage of the opportunities when someone like A.J. Dillon is currently sitting there as like RB34 with an ADP of 102. I mean, that's only on underdog. Imagine what he probably is on ESPN. He's probably in the 120s coming off the board, which at that point, if you're able to solidify a running back that has top 24 upside as a backup handcuff that could potentially even be top 12 if something is to happen to Aaron Jones, as an insurance policy, as a weekly play, A.J. Dillon has production that he can offer to your fantasy team. Just putting this in perspective, in 2022, he was RB25. In 2021, he was RB23. A.J. Dillon has not missed a single game in the last two seasons of his career. Additionally, has seen very similar opportunities in the last two years, 229-224. Yardage-wise, very similar. Touch-wise, very similar. Touchdown-wise, identical. Seven touchdowns, seven touchdowns. Overall, when they give this man opportunities, he has been able to deliver. In games over the last two years where he's played 48% or more of the offensive snaps, averaging 12.66 fantasy points per game in those 16 different contests. In games in which he's been given 12 or more touches, averaging 12.54 half PPR fantasy points per game. A.J. Dillon, amongst all running backs in the National Football League last season, had a rate of 88% of his overall rushing attempts, leading to positive yardage that led the entire National Football League. They are going to put him in scenarios to succeed, and in an offense that runs the ball as much as they do, yes, they can provide both Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon efficient enough opportunities and at a high enough volume to be able to coexist. In the last four seasons, since 2019, since Matt LaFleur has joined this team as their head coach and primary play caller, this team has been number six amongst all in terms of running back rushing attempts, number eight amongst all in terms of running back targets, and number eight amongst all in terms of RB opportunities. This team is going to continue to get opportunities to their running backs, and especially without Aaron Rodgers in the lineup, they may run the ball even more. They have the ninth easiest strength of schedule at the running back position this upcoming season because the NFC North has one of the easiest opportunities, especially within their own division. But going forward, A.J. Dillon may be asked to do even more this upcoming season. Now, when we talk about running backs, specifically two on one team coexisting as top 24 upside players, we've witnessed that a lot in the last five years. There have been 10 different instances in which two running backs within the same team have been in the top 24 together. 
all of those teams ha have been top 10 in terms of running back opportunities within those given years. The last time we saw the Packers accomplish that was in 2021. Obviously, we know that they're capable of doing so, and so is A.J. Dillon. Now, one of the main reasons I believe that A.J. Dillon could be an even bigger fantasy threat than we anticipate is his red zone goal line work. Last season, 10 rushing attempts inside the five-yard line led to four rushing touchdowns. In comparison to Aaron Jones, Aaron Jones had two rushing attempts inside the five-yard line, zero rushing touchdowns. He is clearly the goal line back. He is cl clearly the short yardage situation back. And on top of it is getting himself receiving work at a relatively high volume, enough to where it's cutting into Aaron Jones' overall workload and making A.J. Dillon fantasy relevant. Now on top of that, besides the fact that he had four touchdowns inside the five yard line, there were four different instances last season where A.J. Dillon was tackled down at the one yard line and in the following play, somebody else scored a touchdown, whether it was a reception or a rushing touchdown from a quarterback, a receiver, tight end, etc. This man could have had himself double-digit touchdowns last year. And he could very easily have that under his belt this upcoming season with the opportunities they're going to give him. And especially when you get late into the season, that's when A.J. Dillon begins to really turn it up. Because Aaron Jones starts to fall apart getting up there in age. I think, what, is he 28 this upcoming season? A.J. Dillon from weeks 10 through 18 of the 2021 season was averaging 13.59 fantasy points per game, 16 touches per game. Last season, weeks 12 through 18 was averaging 13 touches per game and 13.58 fantasy points per game throughout the last six games of the season. I understand he's currently being valued as, as a RB3. I get it. But he has top 24 upside. And if not even just that, if something is to ever happen to Aaron Jones, the association of having A.J. Dillon potentially on your roster makes him way better than an Alexander Madison had been in the past. Because not only is he going to provide potential weekly upside within his own performances, if anything is to ever happen to an Aaron Jones, he immediately becomes a top 10 fantasy running back, if not better. I think the opportunity is there. The value is already baked in, and that's what makes A.J. Dillon a must-draft prospect. Thank you, everybody, for watching. That's going to cover for me today. If you guys have not yet already, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Again, we're making daily fantasy football content to try to give you guys as much statistics and data as possible, coupled with my opinions, to lead to your most informed decisions when you approach draft day. Again, if you guys are trying to get additional help for draft day, be sure to travel over to Underdog Fantasy. Use code ANDREW. Make a first-time deposit minimum of $10. You're going to get my draft guide. You're going to get the draft, uh, draft guide rankings along with it. Again, be sure to check your email if you've already done so. It's probably in your spam. I've sent an Excel sheet. I send that every week so that you're up to date regardless of when you're drafting. You'll get the deposit match so you can draft gain experience for your underdog fantasy. And you'll also get rankings weeks 1 through 18 for the entirety of the season. Every single week, weekly rankings in order to help you win a fantasy football championship. Until next time, guys. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Click the like button down below, and I'll see you. Peace. <laughs>